Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Inusor Education. I would like to talk about dynamics of rotational uh, movements. Um, we have already covered kinematics of rotation, where we have introduced the um, angular position, angular uh, velocity, and angular acceleration. Now, in particular, let me just remind you that if you have rotation of this object, then this angle would be our uh, angle of rotation. Um, its first derivative would be a pseudo vector which is always directed uh, along the axis of rotation. Now, the plane of rotation obviously is uh, perpendicular to the axis of rotation and uh, acceleration angular acceleration also is directed along this uh, particular axis of rotation now if you just don't remember it well I do suggest you to go to the um, rotational kinematics lecture earlier in this course and just go through this it's very simple things and that explains actually why uh, the angular velocity vector is along the axis and so is ex uh, angular acceleration. Now, today we will consider the dynamical um, aspects of this uh, movement of the, rot of the rotation, which means we are introducing concept of mass, inertia, force, etc., etc. Now, I'm not going to redefine mass or force for rotational movement. However, um, there are certain other concepts related to rotation which are playing the same role uh, as the force and inertial mass. Um, but for the rotation versus the concepts of uh, uh, force and mass as we know them from translational movement. Now, in particular, obviously we are talking about three laws of Newton. Now, let me just remind you that the first law is about um, an object uh, moving along the uh, straight line with constant speed if there are no forces applied to this particular object. Now, as far as the rotation is concerned, there is an equivalent. Now, imagine that you are in uh, a free space, there are no forces of gravitation or any other forces, and you have this um, spaceship, and for whatever reason it just turns around its axis. It will continue to, to turn if there are no other forces. So basically, as far as the rotation is concerned, this first law of Newton has an equivalent that the, uh, the object rotating uh, around some axis will continue uh, its rotation indefinitely with the same um, angular velocity uh, if there are no unbalanced forces applied to this. Now, as far as the third law uh, of Newton, that the force um, of action has uh, counteraction, it's not really uh, applicable in, uh, for, for, for rotational movement, so we're not considering this. The most important, actually, uh, is the second law. In, um, in translational movement, it stands as this. So we have the force, we have acceleration. So let's just assume that we are talking about straight line movement and the force goes along this straight line, okay? So the force is a vector now. And it's proportional to acceleration, um, where coefficient of proportionality mm -hmm. is the mass of the object. So I would like to come up with something similar in case of um, rotation. Now, what's probably the most important thing is that um, in case of rotation, while force is a source of acceleration, it's not only the force 
which is this particular source. Now, in case of uh, translational movement along a straight line, well, the force, if, if it's applied to the object, and it can, can be applied only to the object, right? So that's the source of its acceleration. Now, in case of rotation, we are assuming that there is a little bit more complicated um, uh, arrangement. So if this is the mass, I probably have some kind of a rod which connects my mass with the axis of rotation. So there is some kind of connection here which allows it to rotate, right? And the force can be applied, well, either to the mass itself, and we will con consider perpendicularly to, uh, to, to the radius right now, or it can be applied here as well. And it will also cause the rotation, right? So the point of application of the mass is important because although this is a point object which has certain mass m, but the point of application of force can, can be not only to the object itself as in the translational movement along a straight line, but also to any position on the road. Or, if you wish, road can be a line again, some kind of a um, infinite, basically, in theory, uh, of the lengths, and we can apply the force here. Now, if we will apply the force here, it will still force the object to move, right? So, my, my first most important kind of point here is that not only the force can be the source of the movement of acceleration, but in, in this particular case, angular acceleration, which we are mostly interested in, but also how I apply this force. Okay, now let's go to experiments. Now, we all know that if you have a door, okay, so this is the door which I'm opening or closing, whatever. Um, now, if I apply my efforts at the edge opposite to the hinges, so these are hinges, that's where it's uh, moving, rotating. If I'm, apply, if I'm applying my force um, uh, at the opposite to the uh, hinges side, where usually the handle is located, I can open the door relatively easy. Now, what if I apply the door close to the hinges? Well it will be much more difficult. We all know that. Actually, I do remember certain hotels where the knob is right in the middle of the door. And it's always kind of extra effort which I have to, um, which, which I have to make to open the door using the knob in the middle. Not as I would expect it based on my experience with the knobs at the edge. So the application of the force, a point of application, is very important. Now, it, um, it, it has been experimentally basically um, determined that um, the acceleration which my force, let's consider that the force is fixed, so I'm pressing at certain uh, point with a certain pressure, the, the, the pressure of the force. So. Uh, it has been experimentally determined that the acceleration of, of the door, of angular acceleration of the door, is proportional to this distance from the axis of rotation. So let's go to this more theoretical picture. Depending on this distance, so this distance is, um, let's say, um, R. Um, so, depending on this distance, my acceleration of this point uh, will be different and it will be proportional, basically, to this, uh, to this distance. So, if I will, let's say, put uh, my force right at the object itself, uh, I will have one acceleration. But if I will put it at half distance from axis to the object, my acceleration will be half of this. Now, if I will put it on, uh, if I will apply my force on this side, for instance, also on the same radius, 
into this into this direction rather along tangential line perpend always perpendicular to the radius okay if I'm applying the, this it will be the same as acceleration is the same as this if I will reduce the radius by two my acceleration will be half so basically my angular acceleration alpha would be proportional to my um, radius now another thing which is kind of obvious it should be proportional to the force itself right twice as strong force will produce twice as much acceleration now this is actually kind of a simple thing because if you consider it um, that we are applying force for instance right at the point then during certain infinitesimal period of time my movement is practically linear right so yes it's along the uh, the circle but we are talking about infinitesimal uh, time interval and in this interval my trajectory actually is almost straight line which means that my linear acceleration a should be equal to f a uh, f m sorry f divided by m right from from this uh, second law of newton but my linear acceleration is radius well let me use capital r radius times um, angular acceleration obviously right from pure geometry from which we go uh, from which follows that obviously alpha should be proportional to uh, to the force right in this case so we have the proportionality between angular acceleration alpha and the um, radius uh, of the point where my uh, force is applied and obviously the force itself so basically I can say that alpha is equal to some kind of coefficient times f times r now what's also um, uh, what has also been observed that if I have a specific uh, object rotating on a specific trajectory of the radius r and if I will change my force if, uh, and, and change my uh, radius to the point where the force is applied as long as their product is the same my acceleration would be the same so this k is a constant basically it depends only on the product of the force and the radius of the point where the force is applied which brings us to a, a kind of a similar situation with this so in the uh, translational movement my acceleration is proportional to force and inertial mass is the coefficient of proportionality in this case <coughs> of rotation my angular acceleration is proportional to something not force but force times r so this force times r actually plays logically exactly the same role for rotational as just force plays for translational movement and obviously there is a special name it's called torque So this product of the force and uh, the radius to the point where the force is applied, this one, is called the torque. Now, um, in uh, some other uh, places in literature in different countries, it's called moment of force, which is basically the same thing. In, in United States, the torque is more uh, common term but in certain European countries for instance they just call it moment of force which basically is the same thing so we have this type of relationship which kind of reminds us this so we found the logical equivalent of the force for translational movement we found the logical equivalent of this to a torque in rotational movement so we have replaced our 
acce linear acceleration with angular acceleration and the force is replaced with torque. Now, what is this coefficient? Well, that's very easy actually to, to come up with this. Again, let's consider this infinitesimal time period. What happens? Well, during this period, my force F will um, uh, will, will, will produce, basically will result in acceleration, linear acceleration of uh, A. Now linear acceleration is R times um, angular acceleration, right? Now, how can I get from this to torque? Well, just multiply both sides by R and I will have F times R equals to M r square alpha. Now, this is the torque and the Greek letter alpha, uh, tau is usually used for, for the torque and this is a coefficient of proportionality which I was talking about, right? Between the angular acceleration and the torque and it's called moment of inertia. Okay, now we have this moment of inertia of this particular um, object of the mass M which is positioned uh, at the radius uh, capital R. Now, we know that if I will replace one torque with another torque which is equal to this, to this torque, I will have exactly the same result because the result depends only on the torque, right? So if I will take another F, lowercase f, and apply it at radius uh, r in such a way that it's equal to F times r, which means, let's say, the r is half of this one, but this F is double this one, so the result will be the same. I will have exactly the same result, the same acceleration. So basically I can say that this formula can be generalized into F times R is equal to I times alpha, where I is the moment of inertia of my mass, which is m r square, where r is the distance. So this is the moment of inertia, and this is a torque. So all together, I can put it in one formula, which looks like the second law of Newton, but only with different uh, concepts introduced. But Basically, it, it reflects exactly the same thing. It reflects certain effort. Now, effort it means, in this case, torque, or, or a moment of the force, which is a little bit more complex than the force for rotational movement. And this is, this represents the moment of inertia. Again, it's not just inertial mass. It's a little bit more than that. It's mass times r square, where r is the distance of this mass. But in any case, it's the same um, logical concept because this is a resistance to the movement. What is the mass? Inertial mass is the measure of resistance to the force, right? So my torque replaces for rotational movement the force for translational and my moment of inertia replaces the plane inertial mass, right? So this is F, uh, I'll use lowercase, okay. F times R, and this is M R square. So this is R, the point where we apply the force, and this is R where the uh, object is located. Now, there is one little complication or generaliza generalization, whatever you want. You see, sometimes, now we were talking 
before we were talking about the force being perpendicular to the radius, right? Now, what if it's not? Okay, let's look at this from the top. So this is my circular movement. So my axis of rotation is this one, right? This is my mass. This is my radius r. Now, what if my force is directed not perpendicularly to the radius, which is, as you probably understand, the most efficient way, right? Um, now, what's the most inefficient way? Well, the most inefficient way, if we, if we direct force right against the, the rod where the, uh, the object uh, is hooked on, right? So that would be most inefficient and it will result in, in zero uh, angular acceleration, right? So if the force is this way or this way, it doesn't really matter, it, it's unstretchable, uh, weightless rod, the result will be zero. Now, the maximum result will be if I will be perpendicular which means tangential to the circle, right? Perpendicular to the radius is tangential to a circle. Now, what if it's at angle? Well, obviously, what we have to do is we have to project here and here. Now, this force can be represented as the sum of these two vectors. This vector will give no result whatsoever because it will be compensated with a reaction of the rod. But this will be the source of the movement which we were talking about. Now, and obviously, if this is an angle uh, between, let's call it beta, this is an angle between R and force F. Now, I will use lower um, case R because the force can be applied not only here, but also here, or, or there, or anywhere else. So r is basically the distance. Now, uh, what's important is angle between them, right? So if this is angle beta, then obviously this thing is um, f times sine beta. So we have f times sine beta. That's a projection. If it's 90 degrees, sine of 90 degrees 1, so that would be the whole force. If it's 0 or 180 degrees, the result would be 0, and obviously there is no movement. So, and everything in between, um, obviously, like that. Now, what is the torque in this particular case? Well, if I will multiply F times R times sine beta, now, I, I hope you remember from the vector algebra that this is a vector product or cross product of two vectors. Vector of the force, which is here, and vector r, which is here. Now, the magnitude of this is this. Now, but this is the vector. Now, this is scalar. So, let's forget about scalar representation and let's use the vectors. And what will be as a result of the vector uh, product of two vectors? It will be a vector which is perpendicular to them both, right? So what is the vector which is perpendicular to the radius and the force? Well, it will be this vector along the axis, exactly the same way as my omega of t uh, and alpha of t of t my angular velocity and angular acceleration. Well, we are actually interested in, actu in an uh, angular acceleration. So, what we have right now is that the tau as a vector is i times alpha as an angular acceleration, because this is along the axis and this is now, this is tau along the axis. So, now this is a vector equation. Well, I think that for simplicity purposes we will rarely consider the force which is going under uh, at the angle to the radius other than 90 degrees, but maybe, but I, I just don't think it's very important. What is important, however, to understand that if we will view the force 
as a vector which has not only the magnitude but also a direction and direction can be not necessarily perpendicular to the radius this is a more general formula for tau for torque this is more general formula for the torque and this is more general formula which is kind of an equivalent of the second Newton's law for um, rotational movement. So that basically completes my um, uh, discussion about rotational dynamics. So you have to understand that there are certain things which are equivalent for rotation to those which we know from the rotation from, from the translational movement. So whatever is the force for translation is a torque for um, rotational movement, which is a vector um, directed along the axis of rot uh, uh, along the axis of rotation. Now the inertial mass m for a straight line movement, translational movement. Um, is equivalent to a uh, moment of inertia, which is mass times the radius where it's located, where it's um, located on, on this circular trajectory. And the angular um, acceleration plays for rotation the same role as linear acceleration for translational movement. Now, I do recommend you to um, to find this lecture on unizor.com in the Physics for Teens uh, course. Um, there is a very detailed explanation of everything which I was talking about uh, during this lecture. I do suggest you to, to read it in, in details because, uh, well, it's just another view. One thing is to watch what, what I'm talking about, another is to read it as, as, as a textbook, basically. But now the textbook probably after this lecture will be a little bit more understandable and I don't know, entertaining, <laughs> uh, if you wish. Uh, by the way, the site is completely free. There are uh, some other courses on this site. For instance, there is a prerequisite course for this Physics for Teens. It's called Math for Teens, um, where you can find, for instance, the vector algebra, you can find uh, calculus over there, and I strongly recommend you to be familiar with all these concepts, whether from this particular uh, course or from somewhere else, but these are definitely needed concepts to be um, mastered before you go to the physics. Um, and the site, by the way, is completely free and there are no advertisements, so I do recommend you to go to the site and watch the lecture from this site and read the notes and there are some problems to solve and there are some exams actually to take if you wish um, okay that's it thank you very much and good luck <laughs>